to talk about uh, paniculitis. I promised you we would uh, talk more in depth about that. I promise that you will not leave this course wanting for information, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, moving right into the next inflammatory uh, skin disease, and again, we'll talk about next year. Um, we'll cover paniculitis this year. Maybe next year we'll cover uh, some other topic, maybe fibrosing and sclerosing dermatitis. So um, just keep in mind when you're filling out the, uh, the forms at the end, other things you'd like to hear about. So, uh, again, paniculitis, this is inflammation of the subcutaneous fat, and uh, the one problem we get into with paniculitis, sometimes our biopsies are not good enough. It's hard to take a punch biopsy and get deep enough and get enough tissue, so it's often a good idea to take an incisional biopsy for paniculitis. Most of these are located on the legs, but they can involve other sites of the body, and they generally tend to be these low-domed nodules or a deep lesions because we're down in the fat. Sometimes you get overlying ulceration and you'll drain a material. That's important and you may or may not get pain. Uh, the two major patterns, we get mostly septal or mostly lobular. Now, it's not 100% of those two, but generally these diseases tend to involve the septa or tend to involve the lobules, and they can be with or without vasculitis. So we're going to talk about some of these uh, various diseases in, in this talk. I won't obviously read this, these charts to you, uh, but we have some interesting things in here. And, and, and this disease, you may not have heard of this, but we'll actually have a couple of pictures of that as well. Okay, so let's start off talking about septal paniculitis without vasculitis. This is by far the most common that we see, and, and the most common is, is erythema nodosum. Uh, it is the most common paniculitis. Usually these patients come with some kind of prodrome of fever chills. They get these tender red nodules, usually the anterior shins. They'll often go away in three to six weeks. And there is a, a chronic form of this. It can go on for many months, but most of the time it goes away. It's usually associated with some underlying processes like a strep infection, uh, certain drugs, sarcoid. So if you get this, you're kind of obligated to figure out why the patient has it. So it's, it's sort of a reaction pattern that's driven by something else. So workup is going to include some things like this, looking at a chest x-ray to make sure they don't have sarcoid, ASO titers, et cetera, to make sure they don't have a strep infection. So you don't want to miss that. And the histology, I'll talk about this in detail, but basically, again, it's a lob septal mostly granulomatous inflammation with some periseptal inflammation. Now, for those of you that are studying for the boards or need to do some uh, MOC or whatever, you'll hear this term, Miescher's radiation granuloma. This is a small aggregation of histiocytes surrounding a stellate-shaped cleft in the center like you see here. I don't use that term. Uh, it's not really specific for erythema nodosa, but generally that's in the literature, so you just do need to know what it represents. The best way to diagnose erythema nodosa, though, is at this power. So you look at low magnification, you see a paniculitis, it's septal mostly, and a little bit of periseptal involvement. You can even see a low power, a lot of these are histiocytes, and as you go to higher magnification, uh, you see neutrophils, some eosinophils often, and then these histiocytes that are often multinucleated. So this is just a beautiful example of erythema nodosa, doesn't get any better than this, and you usually can make a diagnosis at low power, and you can confirm it when you go to higher magnification. So here you see the multinucleated histiocytes uh, and the mixed infiltrates surrounding it. And you will get some involvement of the lobule as well, so it's not purely uh, septal, but it's mostly septal. Scleroderma can also involve the, the fat, and there are several different types, uh, subcutaneous morphia, uh, eosinophilic fasciitis, which gets all the way down into the fascia, and then the so-called pansclerotic morphia of childhood. So these are all kind of disease in the same spectrum. They all have uh, characterized by sclerosis, which is a decrease in the number of fibroblasts and an increase in collagen with homogenization of the collagen bundles. Uh, skin is usually very taut and bound down, uh, often involves the, uh, the trunk and extremities. And here you see some examples of that. So if you were actually to feel this skin, it would feel like shoe leather. It's very, very firm uh, to palpation. And here's another example. This guy's probably heading towards uh, eosinophilic fascia. He's got that kind of groove sign there. So if you look at the histology, it's primarily a septal paniculitis without vasculitis, low power. Notice how thick these septa are. Normally, the septa of your subcutaneous fat are, are about like this. They're very, very thin, and they get markedly thickened. And again, at this power, you can see the sclerosis, the homogenization of the collagen with loss of fibroblast. And here's an example of the inflammatory stage of, of scleroderma involving the fat. You get these nodules of lymphocytes and plasma cells. So very common to see plasma cells 
in morphia. In fact, in any disease where you get sclerosis, any of these morphia-like conditions, scleroderma, they're very common to see plasmas. Same thing in necrobiosis lipoidica, by the way. So here you see that sclerosis again with, with some uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells here. Eosinophilic fasciitis, in order to make this diagnosis, you really have to do a deep incisional biopsy where you get down into the level of the fascia. So if you just take a punch, you're not going to get this diagnosis. It shows the same basic pattern that we saw with the other types of scleroderma and morphia, but it just, it's just a deeper. So you have to take an incisional biopsy there. And as you know, that's condition is often precipitated by trauma. Necrobiosis lipoidica, we don't generally tend to think of this as paniculitis, but it does sometimes go down into the fat. And again, just like with morphia, there's often a lymphoplasma cellular infiltrate. Classic clinical of, of uh, necrobiosis lipoidica, they get these yellowish uh, atrophic plaques, usually on the pretibial areas like this. And higher magnification, you can see all of these telangic tasias here. Sometimes this can even simulate a neoplasm. It looks almost like a cancer in some cases. And here's the biopsy. You see this very dense, diffuse involvement, the so-called layer cake involvement with this granulomatous inflammation and degenerated collagen centrally. And this goes all the way down into the fat where it replaces the fat with that same pattern. And then you get lymphocytes and plasma cells in that as well. Nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, uh, first reported back in 2000, and it's kind of a sclerodermal-like process associated with hemodialysis. Here, instead of getting sclerosis, we get fibrosis, where there's an increase in fibroblasts. And this is associated with gadolinium, gadodiamid exposure, which is uh, in magnetic resonance angiography. These are some examples of these patients with this. They get this bound down skin on uh, the trunk and extremities. Uh, the extremities often take on kind of an amoeboid type of morphology to the overlying skin. And uh, this very, very low power view, you can see there's thickening of the septa, thickening of the fascia, and this will often go all the way down into the muscularis, all the way down into the bone. It's now called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, because we know they get systemic involvement. It's not just in the skin. And this power, you begin to see the increase in the number of fibroblasts here. Another example, and you can again see these uh, fibroblasts between and among collagen metals. There may be mucin. And this thing really looks a lot like scleral myxedema when you look at it histologically. Some of the first cases we saw we actually thought were scleral myxedema until we figured out that it was associated with gadolinium. Here you can see a positive staining with CD34. Uh, the elastic uh, stain demonstrates an increase in these elastic fibers, and there's also an increase in the amount of mucin. So those are some special stains you can do uh, with that condition. Um, there's another uh, looking next, uh, shifting over to localized septal paniculitis with vasculitis. Um, this is a process that kind of picks out the vessels with the septa sparing the lobules primarily. The two ones we see most commonly are polyarteritis nodosa and migratory thrombophlebitis. Now, my PAN can be a panarteritis where you can get small, medium-sized, or large blood vessels involved. Paradoxically, you'd think those large vessels that get involved, they're going to be associated with a kidney disease. They actually tend to do better than the ones that get the so-called micro microscopic polyangiitis that get the renal disease and systemic involvement, interestingly enough. So this is another situation, unless you take a really deep biopsy, you may miss this, because these are really deeply seated blood vessels that are involved. Uh, when you get a large blood vessel that clots off or fibros uh, thrombosis, you'll get overlying ulceration very commonly. And here you see an example, deep biopsy, and then this artery that's involved here has got inflammation within the walls of the artery, and it's also thrombosed here. So when you get one of these larger blood vessels involved, you really don't have to have fibrin, and you don't have to have leukocytoclasia. This, this is abnormal when you get a larger blood vessel that's got this inflammation here. And here you see this elastic lamina demonstrating that it's an artery here that was involved. Uh, thrombophlebitis, these are often cord-like lesions. They tend to be migratory, and they're, again, often associated with other conditions like hypercoagulable states. Uh, can be associated with a so-called trousseau sign associated with underlying cancers. So if somebody presents with this, you're kind of obligated to make sure they don't have something else going on. Uh, here you see some examples of what this thing looked like clinically, and these really almost have to feel this. Uh, histologically, sort of done, a clinic photograph doesn't do as much justice to it. And here you see another larger blood vessel that's involved here with this inflammation. It's thrombosed here. And in this case, it was a vein instead of an artery. So this is, this is thrombophlebitis versus an arteritis. But notice that it's involving mostly the vessel, and the fat tends to be relatively spared, which is kind of interesting. Now, the next pattern is looking at lobular paniculitis without vasculitis. A number of conditions tend to, uh, to lump into this category. Uh, sarcoid, we don't generally tend to think of this as being a, uh, a, a uh, 
paniculitis, but it can involve the fat. And basically what's going on here, you get these deep nodules and you feel these, they feel quite firm to palpation. You can tell they're in the subcutaneous fat. And here you see it, that this power, there's really nothing in the dermis, but you have all these sarcoidal uh, granulomas down here involving the subcutaneous fat and really replacing it. And a uh, classic example of a sarcoid involving the fat. And then this condition, this infantile onset paniculitis with systemic granulomatosis, uh, it's been called Blau-like, Blau syndrome-like granulomatosis, an interesting addition, comes on in infancy and childhood. It's really in the family of one of these auto-inflammatory disorders. It's a lobular, mostly granulomatous paniculitis. It, it can be life-threatening in some cases. It presents often in, in, in young children or in very, uh, either shortly after birth in the first few months after birth or sometimes as late as three or four years of age. And it gives you this very, very painful paniculitis here. And if you biopsy it, it shows this diffuse lobular paniculitis with neutrophils and histiocytes and here you see those multinucleated histiocytes here. So relatively rare condition, but one at least that you should at least know about. Probably the one that's uh, the most important to get is, is this one, pancreatic paniculitis. The good news about this, if you see the histology, it's pretty much pathognomonic. There's really nothing else that will give you this classic saponification of the fat. Uh, one thing that's interesting is occasionally um, you'll see this where the, they'll come in and say, well, there's really no known history of any pancreatic disease. They can have low like chronic pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, or pancreatic carcinoma. But we've seen a few cases where they had a fistula between their gallbladder and their pancreas and they had a little tiny bit of inflammation and it was due to something like that. So if you see this histologically, um, it, you've got to look for something going on in the pancreas. And what's happening here, it's not really an inflammatory process. It's basically a chemical paniculitis due to lipase, amylase, and tryptin, uh, trypsin causing inflammation to generate the fat with secondary involvement. These are some examples. They get these nodular lesions, usually the lower legs, but they can occur sometimes on the upper part of the body as well. And these things will often necrose and they'll drain out a chalky white-like material. And then if you look at low magnification, you see the classic example of saponification. So this is actually your, your body is forming soap in the skin here due to the breakdown of the, the fat material itself with secondary changes. And then the fat actually is what induces the inflammation. So these classic little ghost-like cells here, this very just classic example of, of pancreatic paniculitis. Alpha-1 antitrypsin paniculitis, this can be a really terrible disease. Um, these patients usually come in with extensive widespread necrosis of their subcutaneous fat. Same thing, this is due to like a, a metabolic abnormality destroying the fat with secondary inflammation. If you catch this early enough, they basically get minimal inflammation with the section of the fat lobules from the septa. It's only later that they get all the inflammation. You can see this guy's skin is just really scarred down. He's had multiple areas of paniculitis here with degeneration. And here's an example of just get a very, very diffuse lobular involvement with mostly neutrophils. And uh, this one's actually got a little bit of that, that dissection of the subcutaneous fat away from the septa here. So that's actually the enzymatic dissection that happens first, and then the inflammation comes in here secondarily, uh, causing this really horrible paniculitis. And they get this, they also get lung involvement, and it's really a disease that ultimately is fatal in most patients. And it's mostly neutrophils. You don't want to get too many histiocytes there. Lupus paniculitis, or LE profundus, again, this is uh, uh, the most common paniculitis seen in the upper part of the body. Uh, the face is commonly involved, the scalp, it's often seen in women, and it's got a very, very firm, woody appearance to it. And many of these patients actually are associated with, uh, with lupus erythematosus, not just uh, discoid LE. 70% of these guys will have overlying positive lupus band test. Uh, they may have IgA, IgG deposited. They have low titer ANAs or double strand DNA. So if you have this, you need to really make sure the patient doesn't have systemic lupus. And here you see some examples. These form these very deep-seated atrophic woody gullies in the skin, if you will, the scalp involved here. Uh, the upper part of the body, the trunk, the extremities, arms, and then you get these sort of pockmark-like areas where the fat's just totally degenerated. And uh, when you look at this under the microscope, you get this dense m mummification of the fat, this, this pink hyaline mummification with lymphocytes and plasma cells. And here you see it down here. And notice again, it's involving mostly the lobules, and you get this pink hyaline mummification primarily of the lobules with an infiltrate of lymphocytes and also plasma cells. And here you see it on this high power, power view here. And then if you look overlying, you'll often see some thinning of the epidermis with basal membrane zone change, vacuolar alteration, and thickening of the basal membrane zone. 
Now, there's a couple of diseases that give you lobular paniculitis with needle-like crystals. The two most important ones are subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn and sclerema neonatorum. Uh, what's thought to be the pathophysiology here is an abnormal fat composition in the newborn with an increased level of palmitic acid, and birth trauma may be due to this. Probably this is thought by a lot of people to be a variant of subcutaneous fat necrosis, just a more severe form, and this one actually can sometimes be fatal. Um, they usually get the, it's in the first few days of life, they'll have this. Uh, woody, indurated area often on the dorsal surface of their body, maybe associated with hypercalcemia, and it could be associated with obstetric trauma or intrapartum calcium channel blocker taking by the, the mother. And uh, the most important thing is they can get hypercalcemia that can last up to six months of, of age, and you want to make sure that you're on top of that because obviously that can be a problem. And uh, here you see another example, this uh, firm lesion on this little kid's buttock, and the most common location is on the dorsal surface of the back like here. And if you look under the microscope, they basically get a lobular paniculitis, no vasculitis, with these little needle-shaped uh, crystals that are present both in the lipocytes but also within the histiocytes that come in secondarily to try to sort of, these are almost like a foreign body, if you will. So here you get a multinucleated histiocyte here and then these little needle-like uh, crystals in here that are due to this palmitic acid. A post-steroid paniculitis, an interesting rare condition where if you just take people off of steroids, take them from a high dose to a low dose, they can get the same similar thing that you see with uh, subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn, so just be aware of that. I've, I've actually never seen a case of that. Uh, but sclerema, again, you will see on occasion, and it's basically the same type of process as subcutaneous fat necrosis. They get these very firm, indurated areas. Um, these are usually, uh, these patients have been seriously ill for some reason or another. It's usually seen in preemies. And this actually is associated with a higher mortality that's probably partially related to the underlying problem that the child already has. And again, you don't see fat necrosis here, relatively minimal inflammation. And here you see an example of this, these crystals, these little needle-like clefts here, present both within lipocytes as well as in some of these histiocytes. So it pretty much looks similar to subcutaneous fat necrosis. Now, another one that's probably one of the more commons you'll see is, is hypodermitis or lipodermatosclerosis seen in patients with venous stasis. Stasis is not good. It uh, can cause this, can cause atrophy blanche, can cause just really uh, ulcers and whatnot. And you'll get this inverted Coke bottle type appearance where you get a, a larger area at the proximal side and then it tapers down uh, proximally. So here's a nice example of that here. And if you biopsy this, uh, you'll see changes of stasis overlying and then you'll see these very characteristic features of what we call membranous fat necrosis in the fat. So here you see the thick wall stasis blood vessels here of stasis change overlying. And then we get down to the subcutaneous fat, we see the membranous fat necrosis, these little wispy gossamer changes to the subcutaneous fat here, with or without much inflammation. And then you can actually do a, uh, a special stain, and it's positive for this uh, PAS uh, or a Sudan black, giving you this uh, nice example of that membranous fat necrosis, you know, lipomembranous paniculitis. Now, there are two types of, of uh, lymphomas that can involve the fat, so you need to be aware of these as well. Uh, the first one is, is, uh, is there's a gamma delta, which can be kind of a, gr a very serious form that can be really fatal associated with a bad prognosis, and then there's an alpha beta type that's less serious. This is what we used to call in the old days uh, cytophagic or histiocytic cytophagic paniculitis. You get a very dense lobular paniculitis with these atypical lymphoid cells. And if you look under the microscope, I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is this gamma delta type. It's now known as this primary cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma, usually seen in middle-aged and elderly individuals. They get these nodules and plaques on the extremities. Uh, they can get ecchymoses. They can be associated with uh, hepatosplenomegaly, hemorrhage, pancytopenia. So this is a bad disease, and you really need to, to diagnose this at the relatively early stage. And you see the kind of horrible types of complications they get with these ulcers that uh, very difficult to heal, nodules and tumors that necrose. And uh, this is an example, you can see this very diffuse lobular paniculitis here with these beanbag cells, very characteristic. And they have this uh, characteristic histology, CD3, CD56, TIA1, et cetera, that are very characteristic here. Here's an example. You can see that basically you're, you're getting inflammation, these cells going between the lipocytes. So if you ever see a paniculitis, it looks like it's just involving 
areas between the lipocytes like this at low power. You should think about one of these subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphomas here, and you need to make sure you distinguish between either the gamma-delta type or the alpha-beta type by using immunoperoxidase stains. Here's one of those beanbag cells. These are thought to be lymphocytes that actually acquire the ability to engulf other lymphocytes, interestingly enough, as opposed to being histiocytes. Now, this is the alpha-beta type, much less serious. Again, this is a type that actually sometimes can occur in children, and these guys can very rarely sometimes get this hemophagocytic syndrome, but they can get it in some cases. Uh, these express different markers. They do express these cytotoxic granules, but they're going to have an alpha-beta type of T-cell rather than the gamma-delta type. They do not have any EBV or anything like that associated with it. Here again, you see low magnification, the inflammation involving the, the subcutaneous fat primarily. It's mostly lobules, and these cells are involving areas between the individual lipocytes in a diffuse pattern. And in high magnification, again, you can see that these cells look very similar to the gamma-delta type, but same pattern, same cytology, everything, but it's basically you have to do the special stains to determine whether they're gamma-delta or the alpha-beta, depending upon which of these diseases you're dealing with, and, and these make a significant difference in prognosis. This is CD8, which is strongly positive in the alpha-beta type, and CD7 negative, granzyme B, and this TIA1 positive. So again, those are just some stains you can do to try to help characterize this. There are a couple of lobular paniculitides that have vasculitis, not too many. Uh, nodular vasculitis, again, this is seen, also known as, uh, there's two forms, histologically, so-called erythema neuroticum or nodular vasculitis, the, the Bazan type or the Whitfield type. Um, I don't tend to make a lot of distinction by this histologically when I'm making the diagnosis. The most important thing is to see a vasculitis associated with extensive degeneration of the fat of the lobules. And then you want to make sure that you're not dealing with some underlying process like hepatitis C or possibly tuberculosis. This paniculitis tends to involve the calves as opposed to the shin, and these often will tend to ulcerate, and drain, and oily material. Uh, usually it's a medium-sized large vessel vasculitis, again with this degenerated fat. So here you see the lobular involvement here. And here you see the vasculitis. So as opposed to polyarteritis nodosa, where you just get involvement of this only, you don't get all this degeneration of the fat in the lobules, this condition does cause that change. Now, I don't know why PAN doesn't cause change of the fat like that, but this is very characteristic, and it is seen very, uh, it's almost just diagnostic when you see this pattern with this fat degeneration for nodular vasculitis. Here you see all this extensive inflammation. There's often granulomatous inflammation as well. This used to be thought to be associated with tuberculosis, and some cases are, but, but they can also be associated with a lot of other diseases as well. It's really kind of a reaction pattern. Again, you need to make sure you're not missing an underlying disease. Calciphylaxis, uh, basically what's happening here is that people have renal failure, hyperparathyroidism, uh, and then they get thrombosis of blood vessels, multiple small blood vessels and some larger blood vessels with ulceration overlying it. Um, this is an important disease to make the diagnosis of because some patients can actually have a very acute bad prognosis and you need to get them on sodium thiosulfate. Sometimes you even need to do um, a parathyroidectomy. Here you see some examples of these ulcers. Um, there are some forms where patients actually can go on for a long time with this without dying quickly. So there are some chronic forms we know now, but you need to make sure you're not dealing with this acute form that's going to kill the patient. And when we look at it under the microscope, you'll see this lobular paniculitis with vascular thrombosis. Treatment is basically wound care, these phosphate binding uh, agents and this thodium uh, thiosulfate. Very important to get the patients on that. And then you might even need to do a parathyroidectomy. So here we see a low magnification involvement, primarily the paniculus, all these small blood vessels that are calcified. And as we go to higher magnification, thrombosis of many of these blood vessels. So that's why they get that epidermal necrosis. And unfortunately, the same process is going on in the internal part of the body, even in their heart, and they often die of coronary disease. Oxalosis, don't have any photographs of this, but basically shows the same type of pattern we see with uh, calciphylaxis. So just remember this. Uh, there's a primary type that's rare, and then the most common type is seen in people that have been ingesting things or they've been under methoxyfluorine anesthesia or ethylene glycol. So a few cases a year when people uh, drink this, uh, either to try to, to hurt themselves or they may think it's uh, ethanol, uh, they get uh, cutaneous oxalosis. So the last thing we'll talk about is some of the mixed patterns. These are ones that don't really fit beautifully in any of the classic patterns where we get both septal and lobular, a necrotizing fasciitis caused by infections. Again, you're getting a diffuse infection with strep staph or clostridium, and it just kind of destroys everything in its wake. Uh, the, the classic examples, Malini's gangrene or Fournier's gangrene, these are 
terrible diseases are kind of uh, basically medical emergencies. So if you ever like come into contact with somebody like this, it requires surgical emergency debridement. They have to go in and kind of cut through the fascia and, and marsupialize these things. Here you see the guy's got gangrenous changes here. Skin is now formed a blister due to the epidermal necrosis. And uh, basically when you see this, you just see diffuse involvement with destruction of all the fat here, the vasculitis that's involved secondarily. Uh, there's overlying involvement usually of the, uh, the dermis as well as the fat. And then sometimes we get non-necrotizing fasciitis forms of infectious paniculitis, sporo, crypto, histo can involve the fat. So again, you need to remember these diseases as well. So these again will tend to cause uh, a, a diffuse paniculitis. It doesn't really obey any of the classic patterns that I've talked about earlier. So when you see this, you need to be thinking about this and make sure that you do special stains. Uh, again, you see this diffuse sort of non-specific lobular paniculitis, and the fight stain here was strongly positive. This was an individual that had an atypical mycobacterial infection paniculitis, and this diffuse paniculitis again, looking kind of non-specific with thrombosis of blood vessels, was actually due to mucor that involved the blood vessels. Here you see these aseptate hyphae in here involving the, the vessels as well as the subcutis. And then we get traumatic changes, physical agents that can cause paniculitis. Um, cold, often seen in kiddos, uh, people that suck on popsicles or uh, people that are out riding horses, equestrian paniculitis, scrotal paniculitis sometimes can be seen. And they get these uh, nondescript round uh, sort of urticarial nodules in the skin, usually at the site where they were exposed to the cold. Uh, this is so-called popsicle uh, paniculitis here, where the kid was kind of sucking on a popsicle ear and got this uh, kind of perneal-like change in their skin. This thing really moves pretty quick when you hit it. Um, and if you look at it under the microscope, it usually shows a lobular paniculitis without vasculitis and some necrosis of adipocytes with or without some edema of the papillary dermis. So again, this was related to cold here, uh, just affecting the fat, and notice it's mostly lobular. And then we get people that like to inject things. Uh, either it's done for cosmetic purposes or it's done for other reasons. And uh, these are often seen in funny locations, the breast, the face. Uh, breast implants was a common iatrogenic cause of paniculitis. You see a lot of that in the old days. Uh, the material usually uh, gives you a very uh, diffuse lobular and septal paniculitis and often will polarize. These are some breast implant, uh, breast removed after breast implants have been there that ruptured uh, the penile areas. An area of guys will commonly inject this with silicone and paraffin and other things to try to uh, for sexual reasons, and they get this horrible paniculitis. Uh, this was an individual that had undergone mesotherapy, where they were injecting materials to try to destroy the fat, and you can even see there's some uh, material that you can see on x-ray here. And if you look at this under the microscope, it's, again, very nonspecific, diffuse lobular and septal with these uh, histiocytes and neutrophils, and if you polarize this, it's often positive. Here you see the Swiss cheese appearance of silicone that we see with people that have silicone-injected material in their their skin as well. Uh, sometimes just blunt trauma. If you get uh, injured, uh, kicked or hit or something like that, you can get a secondary paniculitis. Uh, that will often just cause a very non-inflammatory process with these changes that look almost like what you see with uh, stasis change, only it's in a different location. So you get this membranous fat necrosis, but it's in a funny area. Okay, so that's uh, paniculitis. Now you're experts on that, right? <laughs> So uh, again, if you, if you follow this algorithmic approach, uh, generally you can come up with some fairly reasonable uh, differentials. And just remember to take deep biopsies, incisional biopsies, take biopsies at different stages of evolution, and uh, you can come up with uh, reasonable diagnosis. Good. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, blisters. These are important uh, things in the skin that we see. Uh, basically, there are two types that we see, both